I was one of those kids. I had a garbage bag from my foster home to my adoptive oh. home because yeah, what was that like? What was uh, that like? That I think was what I always had this metaphor and, and think of imagery when you're working with children, yeah. you know, what, what do you, if you could describe yourself in an image, what would you be? And mm -hmm. my image was, I was a piece of garbage. I was a piece of garbage. Mm -hmm. And that's when I attempted to end my life. And I was 13. And it, it wasn't until I went into therapy and went, oh my God, I actually believe I'm a piece of garbage. That I started to think about that. And I also felt like I was a crumpled up piece of paper. Yeah. And because I was so tense and trying to bind all of this anxiety and contain it all. And I didn't have any of these interventions. And it just was stuffed inside me like a crumpled up piece of paper. And then I learned, and through that metaphor, I learned to hold that piece of garbage, Ooh. smooth it out, open it, look at it. And then I wrote the words, I love you. Oh. You're worthy. You're important. I needed to learn how to matter to my own self. Well, hi, Jeanette. Thank you so much for being part of our third annual Innovative Child Therapy Symposium. I first met you after stumbling across your handy model, The Brain for Kids on YouTube. And I was like, oh my goodness, I love Dr. Siegel's handy model, The Brain. And you adapted it for children, which you later told me you even have his, his blessing with the, his approval. And so I invited you last year in the symposium and I really got it. Um, a uh, good feel for like, you know, how to help kids. Um, like your specialty is foster care and adoption. And you even have a new book out. So that's what this video is going to uh, focus on is um, working with children in the foster care and being able to help them um, in the in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. But before we jump right in, let me have you tell people who you are and what you do. Oh, well, thank you, Jackie, for having me again. Oh, I'm excited to be here and share some new tools. So I am Jeanette Yoff. I have been a therapist here in Los Angeles for 18 years now, yeah. almost 19, actually. A long and time. A long time. I've had private practice. Now I have a group practice where I train new associate therapists to become adoption and foster care competent. So yeah. I have now five therapists in my practice and we're based in Los Angeles. And I myself grew up in the foster care system in New York. I'm a transplant to LA from New York. And I was in the child welfare system there for six and a half years. So I have a personal yeah. uh, connection to foster care and I was adopted at the age of seven and a half. And I just love this work. It's just so gratifying and to help yeah. children and their families. We do attachment work, we do play therapy, yeah. uh, we do grief and loss bereavement. Uh, mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, we've just increasingly become so much more busy now that mental health is in becoming more important and precedent during yeah. these very vulnerable and challenging times. Oh my gosh, that's so well said. Uh, can you just real quick, I want to make sure that I understand what you said about um, foster care and adoption and competence. So you have like a, a course that teaches us, um, I think about like when I think of the foster uh, foster care system and adoption, like the language that we use, the um, the resources that we recommend, the um, the type of therapy that we do, the, our knowledge of attachment is it, like. What do you mean by competent? What what does that um, 
contain. Yeah, so there's, there's many layers. Children come into the child welfare system because they've uh, experienced attachment trauma. Yeah. Children need their caregivers to facilitate and uh, develop a secure attachment. But most mm -hmm. of the time, children who enter the child welfare system have compromised attachments and they have either the most um, common is disorganized attachment, which okay. is the most difficult to treat. And that's usually a reactive attachment disorder diagnosis. Okay, Brad. And then we have avoidant, uh, avoidant attachment. We have anxious attachment. So we're dealing with the internal family systems dynamic a lot of the times with children who yeah. experience attachment trauma. So we have the attachment trauma, but then we also have the grief and loss layer because okay. children form attachments with their birth families, their families of okay. origin, and then they lose them by entering the child welfare system. And no matter how painful or traumatizing their experience was with their families of origin, mm -hmm. they are still grieving the losses mm -hmm. of their families of origin. And there are many losses. There's attachment it's loss. It's trauma. There's, huh? Yes. There's object loss. Mm -hmm. I, when I left my foster home, I had this little kitten and I held on to it and I lost it in transition to my adoptive home. And oh, I wasn't, I was crying for my loss of my foster family, but I was deeply crying for the loss of that object that represented my foster family because yeah. my foster father had given that to me. And so there's many losses. And then there's loss of self. Who am I? And where am I going? Because now I'm in a whole new environment with different people that appear yeah. to be strangers who I don't know. Don't even know. And you've never seen it before. Exactly. And then I have loss of environment. My old room Ooh. where I used to play. My neighborhood, the park down the street I used to bike to and hang out with my friends. My school. I changed three schools in the matter of three years. Whoa. So there's so many layers of loss yes. beyond the tr attachment trauma. And then we have the residual, the anxiety. Mm -hmm. the depression, the anger, uh, feeling the overwhelm of how do you, for a child to adapt and be resilient. Children are resilient. We know this. However, they can only tolerate so much yes. and before it becomes toxic stress, and then they can become re-traumatized in their new placement, which Ooh. foster care or they're reunified with their birth family and they're not trauma informed they're not foster care informed they don't understand their child now has all these levels of trauma and loss and so there's so many dynamics in child welfare so i have a lot of courses yes on my youtube channel yes jeanette ickley speaking and okay. i will i'll put that link below there that's such a clever name i'll put the link right below this video for those of you watching that want to um access that yeah so a lot of lot of courses on there all free and i really aced acts maxed out my youtube channel during the pandemic you know that it became oh, yeah. what do we do now how do i help people so i have courses on how to help a child grieve um open adoption training, transracial adoption, oh, so um, positive adoption language, how to tell a child their foster care and adoption story with the proper language is so important. Uh, and of course, helping parents understand trauma and trauma triggers and why mm -hmm. your child is behaving this way and teaching them attachment focused parenting. Wow. So, there's so many things. That's to a do. lot. Endless. It is a lot. It's good stuff. As you were kind of describing your experience of moving and leaving everything behind and all these strangers, I'm thinking of like the polyvagal theory and thinking about how like Deb Dana, she says, we need to be, we need to feel safe in our relationship, in our environment and in our body. Just that one experience leaving your relationships are like severed. These people that you form this connection with are gone. And then your environment is totally different, which is a cue yes. of danger. I could imagine that. I, if, is there, you know, are there any words that even can describe what that's like for these kids? Right. It, it's bereavement. It truly is bereavement because most of the time, typically children who enter the foster care system and they're older, they usually aren't reunified 
and we don't know the statistic of reunifications yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd really like to know, uh, but children end up in the foster care system and they form many attachments to different, different foster homes. And so there could be multiple losses, ungrieved, unresolved. Yes. Oh. And so they're walking around with all these questions. And one of my interventions is the question box, just putting all the questions in a shoe box, just so we mm. have a place and a space and acknowledgement mm -hmm. of the, like a grief inventory of these losses, because typically a lot of parents don't have the language and they're not trained to be adoption competent, being an adoptive parent. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's just insane, especially yeah. in private adoptions. There's no training. They can, you know, find an attorney, an adoption attorney, request that we'd like to adopt a child. Please play, connect us with a birth mother. And there's no formal training. Yeah. So they don't know, like when there's dysregulation and all of this going on, they don't know what's at the root, which can definitely impact the response or reaction to it. Of course, of course. What's driving the behavior? All behavior Ooh. is a communication of an unmet need. Oh, let's pause there. Of, That's big. So say that one more time. All behavior. All behavior is a communication of an unmet need. Mm. And for children in foster care, there are many layers of unmet needs. Yes. And sometimes they don't know how to organize it internally because they're so young. They don't know how to make sense. And it, they stuff it, which is what I did. I just kept stuffing and stuffing and stuffing. Yeah. I'd have a thought and I go, oh, I don't know who understands this thought. And I needed therapy. And I didn't go into therapy till I was 13 years old because oh. I had suicidal ideation. Mm. I needed it much earlier. Children need therapy much earlier, as we know, and everyone on the symposium understands, well, is going to understand. Yes. Children need it as young as three. I have children oh, yes. come in who are adopted because they're asking these questions. Who, who, where is my mommy? Yeah. Or what happened to my family? So we need to acknowledge and go, yes, it's okay to have those questions. Of course, we can only imagine how many questions you're holding inside mm. your heart, your mind, and we're going to put them in a question box. So you have a place for them and we will get to answer them one at a time one week at a time when the child's ready. We never do something until the child's ready, always following the child's lead. Yeah. And at the same time, there's a fine line because adoptive parents and therapists need to be direct mm -hmm. in a careful, delicate, with sensitivity yeah. because it's vulnerable. Yes. But children need us to show them yeah. Okay. Give them permission. Of course, you're thinking about uh -huh. your first mother and that's okay. And we understand that and we can only imagine what that feels like for you. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to feel sad, mad, confused, yeah, angry, angry, overwhelmed. So what you're saying is like all of these big emotions, like you're, I just had a um, interview with Lisa Dion and is, uh, she talked about like, um, you're fine just as you are, like not um, that word pejorative again, not really judging what's happening to them, good or bad, giving them permission to feel because pain demands to be felt. Yes. My goodness. So yeah, there's also, <clears throat> and I think something that I wanted to bring up today is shame. Oh, yes. Because a child has been removed mm -hmm. from their families of origin and because children are egotistic, they believe it's their fault. Yeah. So, it's all the world revolves around me, even yes. when it's painful. So especially with foster youth, they have and experience a lot of shame mm. because they believe it's their fault. I had one boy, he was seven years old and he was in the car with his dad and he wouldn't put his seatbelt on and he's sitting in the back seat. And his dad got increasingly flipped his lid. He got yeah. increasingly upset. He had no gap in there between impulse and his control. And his child was acting out in the back seat while he turned around because he kept telling him, put your seatbelt on, put sit down, sit down. He wouldn't sit down and he turned around and he punched him in the back oh. seat of the car. 
just yeah. as a squad car was driving past. Oh, goodness. Got pulled over, was arrested on the spot. And this happens. Whoa. Child witnessed everything. Yeah. The first thing he said when we started doing therapy was, it is all my fault. Oh, he took it on an internal shame. Totally. Oh, I feel and that. Was, and I feel that in my oh. heart. It like puts tears behind my eyes. Wow. Yes. Even adoptees separated at birth have a part of them, because yeah. I'm also an internal family systems therapist, has a part of them that they believe is wrong, deficient, unlovable, Ooh. unwantable. How could any mother place her child for adoption? There must have been something wrong about me. Yeah, I'm defective. I'm not worthy. I think about that book. What's that book? The um, the womb. Um, gosh, I'm the primal sorry. womb. Yes, a primal womb. You did just, read that? Yeah. Oh goodness. Yeah. yeah. It even just the title, really. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. So, so I have a lot of Nancy Verrier who wrote that book. We have yeah. a lot of videos. She presented at a conference that I produced on my YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about the oh cool, womb. Oh, I'll and put a link more, to that. Yeah. yeah. And if you are a therapist who's interested in becoming more adoption competent, yes, you want to read The Primal Wound. Mm -hmm. I also have a Amazon Associates list of books for if you want to become more adoption competent, go to Genetically Speaking. I think it's Associates. We could put the link below. And yeah. I've been making lists of books specifically targeting um, different experiences that children grow, go through. And like, um, that's trauma, so good. Sexual that, abuse. Yeah. Like all these incarceration. Different Sorry. Oh, yes. Incarceration too. And I'm thinking before we even got on here, you had mentioned you'd written a book for kids too. Yes. Yes. So can you show that really yes. quick? Just, uh, because I think about like that psychoeducation and, oh, that's so good. I'm an what EMDR therapist and that's something I would use in phase two for preparation. Exactly. You know, bibliography, I mean, is so important. It, it's that's beautiful. It's explaining it? to kids the process that sometimes families just can't live together. And here are the reasons why. There's Ooh. many reasons a child of uh, someone becomes pregnant. They're too young. Their families don't support them. Mm. The mother's all alone. She can't do it all by herself. Jeanette, this is beautiful. Drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm addiction parents who don't know how to parent properly See, all that like can really kind of challenge that it's my fault i'm not good enough right. I'm what's effective. wrong with you what's wrong mm -hmm. with you a, a parent who's always assuming that negative motive or that's the way they were parented we will parent the way we were parented um, i could imagine some people yeah. like even adults could read this and really oh, yeah. kind of can't walk away with a little bit more of like uh, uh, uh understanding i think even dr siegel says well even dr especially dr siegel says <laughs> if we can make sense of it it's a game changer that helps us to make sense of it exactly exactly and and you know the per your father the father may have gotten scared and moved away right oh, my just because you become a parent doesn't mean you know how to parent. It can be very overwhelming to be a parent. That's to so begin true. With. And what happens? We fight, flight, or freeze. That's yes. in a way. And, and oh when the goodness. child realizes it, it wasn't about you, mm. it was about the circumstances in your parents' lives at that time that led them to this decision. It can make that shame either lessen or even lift. Oh yeah, my flip goodness. the shame, flip that script. Um, they may be homeless and cannot provide food or shelter. Or mm. home. They may have died. They may be incarcerated or they may have mental illness. It's not that they won't parent, they can't parent like a child needs. And then I talk about the process that the judge is involved, there's a social worker, the child gets a social worker. And then you get placed in a family. That's and then so what can you do about that? You can ask questions. You can do your question box. Oh, my goodness, Jeanette. You thought of it all. These oh. illustrations are something else. Thank you. So first I made an animation. 
This was during the, right? Yep. During the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. And I'll put a link. You gave me a link. I'm, the link is below yeah. this video for those there's watching. A, so there's an animation. And then I said, you know what? It'd be great to turn the animation because you already have the, the illustrations into a book. So today's topic is, you know, what is foster care and adoption? Yeah. And so I also have what is foster care. That's my latest animation that I created with the same illustrator, which I'm also going to create into a book because May uh, every year is National Foster Care Awareness Month. And every November is National Adoption Awareness Month. May and November. Okay. Okay. So I always like to do things for that month. So I'll have what is foster care out in May. So do you want me to talk more about shame? Yeah. Well, I have these questions, but it literally just popped in my mind. Um, you're like your passion. I think about, I just read, oh, like several times, Dr. Bruce Perry in Oprah Winfrey's What Happened to You. And they say that your trauma, your pain makes you kind of who you are. You have transformed that into, I don't know, feel kind of emotional about like these beautiful gifts, that book, the book alone. But that's not all you have. You have the book, you have this YouTube channel, you have this competency program, you're working with the children directly, you're working with parents. So gosh, thank you. Thank you for like being you. I like totally got hijacked. I feel like crying. (laughs) So it's beautiful. Okay. So I, you asked me, you know, what the structure of it. And quite honestly, I didn't even feel, um, competent or, or um, knowledgeable enough to even suggest what you should talk about. I so I asked you what people sure. need to know. And I know a lot of people watching this are new clinicians, they're educators, mm-hmm. there's some parents. So you kind of provided me with four questions to ask you to mm-hmm. kind of uh, get um, everything going. Okay, so the four questions. Let's start with the first one. Why do children in the foster care system tend to have low self-esteem? Oh, and that goes with what you were just talking about. Yes. So the low self-esteem is that egotistic part of themselves that believes it was all their fault. And children typically who've experienced trauma believe it was all their fault. And so shame, and you know, Brene Brown has talked about this. I am connecting this to children and how I explain even to children and parents what's going on in your child's internal world. Mm -hmm. So shame is directed towards the self. Guilt is directed towards the behavior that caused distress for that person. What happens? So shame versus guilt. Like I Mm -hmm. am bad and I did something bad. It's different. Exactly. So children who go through the foster care system and no one's helping them understand it was not your fault. They're going to walk around believing it was their fault Mm. and they're going to perceive their themselves as bad, worthless, unlovable. Mm. And the child feels that there's nothing they can do to fix that because that's who they are. You see, that's who they believe they are. As a result, they're likely to deny, lie, make excuses about their behavior, and especially blame others for their behavior. Oh, you just Uh described it. You just described it. That's what a lot of times is like the presenting concerns. Yes. It's rooted in shame. Red flags that you know you're, you're working with a child who has shame or even pervasive shame. It's just day in and day out red flags are they take everything personally so any criticism Mm. they don't see as constructive they see it as you're attacking me oh the out of proportionate response real upset exactly they can't differentiate themselves from their behavior it's all one it's all mashed together like mashed potatoes and it's so feels so messy so a lot of these kids when and, and the way I explain is, imagine you're in a bubble yeah. and in that bubble, there's a mirror mm-hmm. and the mirror only reflects your bad self. It Ooh. just shows oh, your good. ugliness, your deficiency, your terrible, the worst of the worst you could imagine. Okay? Mm. 
And that's how they're walking around with this bubble. So when someone goes, hey, you made a mistake, they go, I'm the mistake. I'm a mistake. They can't realize it's not my behavior. It's me as a whole person. So Mm. what happens is excessive shame impedes the development of guilt, which is so important Mm. for kids and children. Yeah, it's it's a tough one because parents get confused because they tend to see the child. They can't apologize. It's not that they won't. The won't can't metaphor. It's they can't because when they apologize, when the parent goes, oh, you just made, you just did something wrong. The child believes they're all wrong. And the parent goes, well, you need to go take responsibility for that. And if you're not trauma informed or attachment informed, you're actually going to reinforce shame in your child. Because when you say, go apologize to your sister, this is what the child does. And I always act this out for, um, clinicians and therapists and social workers and parents. So the child fights the parent, you know, there's that control battle. I don't want to go apologize, but eventually there's usually parents exhort to consequences, threatening, which is not adoption competent, um, to get the child to do the right thing. But the parent is not understanding that the child's being forced to apologize, not from their own internal sense, but from an external threat of, to mm. their existence. So it makes it worse. It makes it worse. Exactly. And the child will go up to that kid and go, I'm sorry. But what are they really saying? Say, I am sorry. I'm like a bad person. I'm not good enough. I am. Mm. Exactly. And it's so painful. And I was one of those kids that, it made me feel worse because mm-hmm. I now I'm validating how bad I am. And then I'd go off and I would be left with all these feelings. I'm such a bad person. Oh. It took me years to build self-esteem. Oh my so goodness, you just explained it. I have never quite looked at it in that light. So forcing an apology or putting shame and threat or punishment in these situations actually exacerbates the problem. Exactly. Worse. Yeah. So there is an intervention that I developed, which came out of Holly Van Gilden. It was another wonderful therapist. She's been around for years. She's like a Violet Oaklander, oh. but it's the world oh. of foster care and adoption. She really helps parents understand attachment and trauma and uh, bonding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so she had this metaphor. You need to help the child separate themselves from their behavior. Mm-hmm. And she, she mentioned the word sandwich. You have to do this sandwiching. And I said, mm-hmm. oh, that's really interesting. Because I'm always trying to, what do adults say? And then bring it down to the child yeah. brain. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's then I created, how you made the handy model of the brain for kids. Oh, okay. And I created the shame witch. Oh, oh my goodness. That's so clever. <laughs> which I'll oh put a goodness. link below. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. That's so, pretty. Okay. So the bread on which the the top of your best friend inner voice you. Wow. Okay. So explain it. Yeah. So the shame, which is, so if if you recognize your child is living in shame or as a therapist, you're going to teach the parent this technique. The parent needs to then separate the child from their behavior and go. So the bread on the bottom is the validation is the stroking is the pulling out the goodness in who they are. Mm -hmm. You're a good person. You're doing the best that you can. We all make mistakes and that's how we learn. And the pickle, the lettuce, tomato, all that stuff we're dealing with. Yeah. We're, it's a narrative approach, which is what this is. That's the mistake that we're going to work on, that we're going to look oh, at together, that we're going right to figure right. out, we're going to problem solve. That math problem is wrong. You're not wrong. The math oh. problem is wrong. Oh, You're not a mistake. Oh. The mistake is the mistake. Ooh. And the bread on top to sandwich it all together is your good person, that inner best friend, you. Children who have pervasive shame don't have this part developed. It's so minute. It's like a speck. Yeah. So we're growing that part. You're a good person. This growth mindset, you're learning. It's okay to make mistakes. And tell yourself, you're not the mistake. The mistake, all this stuff is the mistake. 
Oh, so separate yes. yourself yeah. from the problem. And so I literally, and I'll, I can give you a link to this. Okay. So therapists can use it. Okay. Both you write this out with the child. Oh, okay. So they can really kind of put their own um, stuff in there. So what I hear you saying is that really it's shift in that internal dialogue that felt sense for the kid. Like I'm not the mistake or I'm not bad or I'm not worthless. It's what had happened. Oh, right. that, that's a life it's, changer. It's the circumstances in my birth mother's life at that time that she couldn't parent any baby born on my birthday. Oh, even that. Like it wasn't about me. And the moment we narrative and take that, put that story in its place, we yeah. can then have objectivity. Mm. When we have objectivity. Yeah, it takes it out we, of that. Yeah, we have awareness. We can look at it and reflect on it, think about it, process it for greater mental health. Oh, that's so good. Oh my goodness. That one piece. I can imagine what your program is like. I can imagine what it's like to be your client. Okay. So let's go with question number two. What intervention is helpful? Oh, the shame witch. So we did that one helpful to help them feel better about themselves. I love that's so clever too. the shame, witch. And I think about Dr. Siegel, obviously we're yeah. both big Dr. Siegel fans, uh-huh. but name it's tame it. That's what that is. Exactly. 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 So good. Now the third one, what interventions help a child with grief and loss, which you told us about, that's like a big part of it, the grief and loss. Yes. Yeah. We, we must understand. And there's an adult adoptee who said, it feels like a wake. We're just sitting in a wake mm. that has not been able to have a proper ceremonial there's no closure. There's no, closure. maybe not even any identification of it. Just like, right. uh, just going to a different place and wow. Right. And, and snap out of it, get over it. Right. Go to school. Like, it's just like, it's insane. What we expect the adult characteristics we project on children It yeah. is just insanity. And Bruce Perry says that the brain does not fully develop until the age of 31. 31. That's older than I thought. Yep. Goodness. Gosh, I did make some stupid decisions before 31. (laughs) Of course, your 20s. You do. You're trying to figure out who you are. Yeah. What you want. You're mastering your skill set. Uh huh. And you're making a lot of mistakes, which is what you want to do in your 20s (laughs) and learn. And learn from them. Jeanette, something's crossing my mind when I think about the grief and loss. So my friend, she's like a fantastic clinician. She talked about when kids move, a lot of times they're carrying a, it just hurts my heart, a bag, a garbage bag with their stuff in it. So Mm -hmm. she would provide a, like a duffel bag or something like that. Oh, yes. There's what, many organizations um, that do that now because we understand. I was one of those oh, kids. I had a garbage bag from my foster home to my adoptive oh, home because yeah, what was that like? What was uh, that like? That I think was what I always have this metaphor and and think of imagery when you're working with children. You know what? What do you? If you could describe yourself in an image, what would you be? And mm. my image was I was a piece of garbage. I was a piece of garbage Mm. and that's when I attempted to end my life and I was 13 and it it wasn't until I went into therapy and went oh my god I actually believe I'm a piece of garbage that I started to think about that and I also felt like I was a crumpled up piece of paper and because I was so tense and trying to bind all of this anxiety and contain it all and I didn't have any of these interventions And it just was stuffed inside me like a crumpled up piece of paper. And then I learned, and through that metaphor, I learned to hold that piece of garbage, smooth it out, open it, look at it. And then I wrote the words, I love you. You're worthy. You're important. I needed to learn how to matter to my own self. Oh, that's when the healing it's so that's when that changed because I mean, obviously it's shifted since then. Yeah. And I felt so bad about myself. And so 
most children, and I'm going to say most, have this part of themselves. For some of them, if they've been with their family for a long time, they have a greater sense of self, of course, and maybe there was just a, uh, one um, acute trauma, you know, yeah. single incident trauma that led them to enter the foster care system, and they actually are okay. They have a good self-esteem, um, but some kids, the younger they are, the harder it is for them to make sense and separate themselves from the circumstances of their experience of why they were removed from their foster families or oh my goodness. families of origin. So they're left with just all this stuff inside. So yeah, even the, the garbage bag metaphor, uh, yeah. I do arts festivals uh, for foster youth and adoptees. And um, even just that metaphor of what, if you have a feeling like you're holding all this baggage, well, what's in there? Yeah. Let's identify what's in that bag, baggage. Put it out. In the... And let's pull it out. Oh, yeah. gosh. One by one. Because it, for a clinician, you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because oh a lot of children in foster care have very intense, overwhelming experiences. And that's a muscle that I learned. But I would, when I first started doing this work, and I come from the experience, I would leave sessions crying just feeling so much for these children and then realizing too, wow, like I didn't have it that bad. Like I didn't have chronic abuse. Yeah. It actually helped me go, okay, well, I'm going to give back and I'm going to learn how to tolerate this experience with them. That's the only way they're going to learn to tolerate it within themselves. Oh, like an external regulator. And now you're teaching us all this stuff. Oh yeah. I love teaching. See, that's something that for me, when I was in therapy, I didn't get a lot of psychoeducation and I'm really big on these interventions, like the shame witch. Yeah. And so the other one that I wanted to share was my sad bag. So okay. when I started working with kids, like what's an intervention, maybe hard to see, but. Oh, you know, okay. There things to do when I feel sad, whoops, to help my broken heart feel glad. That's just what's oh. written on the sad bag. Oh, I love okay. it. Things to do when I feel sad to help my broken heart feel glad. So it's a coping skill, sad bag. Okay. So, um, so that I you're kind like, of making the kid competent, right? I think about the word competency and how it could be like uh, their their competency and coping. Correct. Yes. It's, I love that. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. I'm teaching them skill sets to be competent in their experience. Oh, exactly. oh, that's so good. So Jeanette, you said something that I just want to flesh out a little bit, the sense of self. And you mentioned Violet Oaklander. I literally just took that training. I, I'm just amazed by how powerful it is. These oh, yeah. kids that have all these kind of um, painful, uh, like just a sense of self, like statement, like I'm garbage or whatever. Yes. When you do her when you do that um, Oaklander model, you can really work through that stuff so beautifully. Yeah, expand it, right. Yeah. Unpacking. Projection. Yeah. Yes. So good. Okay, so the last one, do you, oh yeah, oh yeah, let's talk yeah. about your book. Um, and we, we just did, there's going to be a link, is that for sale right now? Yes, it's on Amazon. Okay, so there will be a link for it. Hold it up real quick. And you said that one's you, that the little girl yes, is you. So, yeah, because I was I, I modeled it around a um, an older child who goes through the foster care system and then is adopted. Because um, typically today most adoptions are foster care to adoption. Um, newborn adoptions are have lessened in our country. So now, because we have so many more children, uh, 453,000 children across the country in foster care right now. Whoa. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so we need competent clinicians. Oh yeah. You um, need to yeah. today. Like um, pretty much everybody. I'm thinking to myself, like, who would that be a good training for? Anybody, any helper? Exactly. Yeah. I just did foster care one-on-one training, which I'm thinking about putting on my YouTube channel. I have to break it up. It's a whole three hour training. I think, yeah. Foster care one-on-one. So look out for that. Uh, but I wanted to share what's in the sad bag. Okay. And so, and I do have 
children's mental health videos that I've created two on my YouTube channel. And one of them is how to make a sad bag for kids. Oh, of course. And I literally am talking to kids going, here's how you make a sad bag. <laughs> my secret wish, and I want to say this, I've always loved, I would love to have a kid's TV show, but is any producers listening? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would watch it and I would tell I would everybody I know to watch it too. <laughs> I grew up on Mr. Rogers. So oh, yeah. I would just sit and I, and I remember I was in foster care and I would sit, Mr. Rogers, I felt was talking to me because he was the only person who really started talking about feelings. Yes. And having an experience mm -hmm. and, and I could hear him and slowly make sense. I think he was a big part of my Ooh. development, Mr. Rogers. Oh, yeah. He was a resource for you. You were able to kind of identify. Wow. So wow. in the sad bag, so there's a tear scream pillow. So okay. the child can draw their feelings on their tear pillow. And then, of course, provide parent provides a... Um, empty pillowcase, put the pillow in there so the child can go to the tear pillow and cry and mm -hmm. all the tears can be held and be externalized. And there's a place and a space beautiful. for these feelings, okay? Because that they will cry beautiful. and it's important to cry. Yes. Then there's paper. You can journal if the child's young enough to journal. Mm -hmm. and I'm showing you different samples. I like the number three. Have Me the two. Provide the options and ask the child what three interventions will work for you because we need to also instill in them, you are the expert in your life. Yes, it puts I them in that, that they're, they um, can, what do they call it? That self-actualization, like where they can yeah. be in charge of, they can be the yes. boss themselves yes. with your support uh, in the beginning. Then a photo book is just putting pictures of things that make you feel good. Mm. So here's it a well, wolf dog yeah. is it like what pictures yeah, oh my gosh that make is that a pig with boots that <laughs> makes that would be in my book <laughs> right oh, what can it. make you just feel good and have gratitude so this could be a gratitude journal it could be a picture that makes you just feel oh. silly and good to shift you out of and it doesn't have to be like this again we're thinking out of the box it could be 10 index cards that you staple together Mm -hmm. Right. We're, we want to be creative, innovative therapists when we're working with children, always adaptable. I always mm -hmm. find myself having to really key, That's stay so open-minded and adaptable. Um, and I don't because you need to kind of think on your feet because something may present oh. itself and you have to kind of know like what, what needs to be done here and what, what's happening that can meet exactly. that. Exactly. And then the other thing is I put worry dolls too, as an item in the sad bag, because worry dolls, there's a lot of worry with sadness. Usually there's something unresolved, there's something there still understanding, and it gives them an opportunity to externalize and put words to it. So each worry doll take the worry doll it's actually it comes from guatemala it's an old legend oh that, you know they're like, tiny right they're little tiny dolls that have little string wrapped around them yeah so beautiful. and you take the doll out before bed and you tell each doll a worry and that you're feeling or thinking or if, you know it could be anything a feeling and then you tell each doll a worry or what you're feeling then you put the dolls back into the bag and you put the bag underneath your pillow and throughout the night, the worry dolls are going to think and talk about and problem solve these worries. And when you wake up in the morning, you'll feel more relieved, right? But that's the myth. That's that's when you that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And it also helps the clinician understand what's going on in here. Yeah. That is crucial because a lot of these kids hide it. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to be open and acknowledge, and they don't know. It's vulnerable. It hasn't been safe yeah. for them in the past. So we say, hey, the dolls are going to hold it for you. So I had this one kid, funny story, talking about being adaptable yeah. as a therapist. So we did. I did this with her, and she believed, and she was in foster care, that her birth mother was going to come back and kidnap her. Okay. We had no idea she was thinking this until she scary. made the sad bag. And I said, wow that's a big feeling you're having. Oh, and then what we did was we did a safety roll around her house that she's safe and, and mitigating that 
her birth mother even knew where she lived just to fact mm-hmm. check this um this um that's so powerful. irrational belief but irrational based in you know she was scared because she had had visits with her first with her birth mother first okay. mother it was different terms um and she felt that her mother was going to come and she, I think her mother may have told her I'm going to come back and get you okay so she accused of danger exactly would flip her lid or her lid probably didn't even go fully down if she's but she didn't even know before the bag that she was even that was even a thing for her we had no idea so fear when I and I was doing in-home therapy because a lot of when you're working with children and child welfare within the system you're actually traveling to their homes Mm -hmm. and I would do therapy in their rooms and my whole back of my car was filled with play therapy items. And I've been um, there before. Like you yeah. open the door and like balls <laughs> fall out and blocks. And- <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Crayons all over the place. Um, <laughs> I know. And so she, uh, so I walk in the door and she's mad at me and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And I'm a new therapist. I'm going, oh no, did I help her or hurt her? And she said, And she's like stamping her foot, like patting her foot. And she's got her arms crossed. And I go, oh, hi, how are you doing today? She says, I'm mad at you. And, you know, I'm a therapist. Validate, validate. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Let's talk about this today. I'd like to know what you're mad at. What What happened? What did I do? What did I say? Tell me. Like, we just go right into the trauma, right? And she goes, those worry dolls didn't work. Oh, so she and I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And I, and I just thought for a minute, I said, just allow yourself to process this. And I always repeat in my mind what kids say. It helps me yeah. stay connected. And I go, hmm, the worry dolls didn't work. And then I thought, I know what we're going to do today. We're going to make bigger worry dolls. Oh. And you know what she said? yeah and it became see like we expanded we just I saw it wasn't enough and I I thought what is it it's lacking something it wasn't enough let's make it big enough so you can take one little intervention and make it bigger Um, like even what I'm showing you in the sad bag can be one session yes Um, so I also have a wish book. So it's Mm -hmm. a wish because with children in foster care, they do have a lot of wishes Mm. and wishing is also another way we work through depression because we have something we're looking forward to. Oh, it gives us, oh, I think about there's that future. It's not when you're stuck in say like dorsal vagal shut down freezers. It's hard to even consider the future that puts them into Things could change. I, things could get better. It gets hope. Yeah. And I like kids to, if there's a, a, a wish that's possible, I will. And, and I do a lot of family therapy. Sometimes I'm working with a child alone, but I'll go, is there one wish you think we could tell your mom or dad or your grandma to come mm. true, to make and come true oh. so that there's that follow through, right? We're not just wishing for random things let's see if we can put reality to one of these wishes because uh-huh. that also solidifies on being acknowledged heard yeah. seen, i matter received, i matter right mm. and then there's paper to draw a picture about my sad feelings mm. you want to just you know simple these are simple little things and then i have sad busters and i make these cards so they're just <laughs> blank cards sad buster so creative you can even just write sad buster you don't even you can use a little yeah. next one and uh-huh. then you write on the back what you're doing with your sad. Oh, say a loving kindness to the person I miss. Three wishes. Oh, that's so good and so simple. I mean, so simple. it doesn't take any. Um, exactly. Yeah. Ask my parents for a hug, right? That's a need. We need to, a lot of kids do need to just be held by their parents and just cry. Yeah. Not talked out of it. A lot of working with the child who's grieving is learning to be with their grief, not talk them out of it, not them. feel them out of it, just hold them mm. and go, yeah, it's okay to cry. It's okay. You have a lot to cry about. Mm. 
Oh. And I was one of those kids. My mom would say, because she wasn't adoption company, she goes, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Oh, so there's some shame. Like, yeah, you're, you're. So I, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And then I had, then I had to do this. Okay. Just stuff it down. Stuff it down, stuff it down. And, and so I had a lot of anxiety and, and the repression is what causes, causes anxiety and yeah. depression and anxiety are, uh, yeah. the word? they are, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a swing like pendulum. They actually yeah. counterpart each other. Uh, go get my bubbles. So bubbles flow three wishes into the air. Oh, I love that. So they can have bubbles. That's good because it has a breath work. Yeah. Go to my mirror and make a funny face really big. Yeah. Hey, real quick, Jeanette, let's make a funny face. Three, two, one. (laughs) (laughs) You have to be playful to be a play therapist and work with children. A little bit crazy. (laughs) Yeah, you have to get out of your way. Yeah. And the more you practice, the better you get. It makes you safe. It It does. It makes me feel young working with children. I love it. Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like to be your, uh, be your client. I mean, I literally, I feel your love. I feel your passion in your knowledge base is like fascinating. I mean, I've done a lot of research because I was like, what did I need? What did I need? And I needed a lot. And that's where my interventions came out of. And that's when I wrote my first book, Groundbreaking Interventions, Working with Children in Foster Care and Adoption. Okay, I'll link that below here too. That book too. And it has all these interventions, my anger bag, my sad bag, my stress bag, um, how to tell my adoption story, the question box. Oh, so good. And so the last intervention that I'll share with this, so then you want to put crayons in the sad bag too. Okay. Ooh. This is called a comfy doll. Mm-hmm. C-O-M-F-E-E. Now, this is something I add, especially with young children. It can represent the person that they've lost. Oh, well. they're grieving for. And really, these, you can get them on griefwatch.com. I don't make okay. them, but they okay. are handmade and they're filled with lavender. And you can actually put them in the microwave for a minute. Oh. And they're warm. Oh, okay. Grief watch. And I think that warmth, the neuroception of safety and the softness, even just looking at you're holding it and I can read the way that your body, and I know you like lavender because you showed me you have a little bottle yeah. of lavender right yeah, by you. Want, yeah. You want to make sure though, first kids aren't allergic to lavender. I always have to yeah. make sure. I have had um, one parent that was allergic. Yeah, that, that is a thing. Yeah. And then um, in the book, Trauma Healing, there's a kid's book. You can imagine you're breathing in your birthday cake instead of using lavender. Okay, wait, wait. What, what, breathing in your birthday cake, like, yeah. So cake? imagine, imagine your birthday cake and it's a, make it a big one in big. front of you and just it might be an ice cream cake. Cake smells like and go, mm, right? It smells so good. It does smell good. Do we blow out any candles or no? Yeah, let's blow out some candles. <gasps> oh, <laughs> there's a lot of candles there. Oh my gosh, this has been amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so say we say your website one more time. It's down below, and um, can you find the competency course like through the link? Is that all in the same place? Yes. Yeah, so I do have three websites because okay. you have I have three. my yacht therapy practice. You like three. Mm-hmm. I like three. Too. <laughs> I like three. Then I have Jeanette Yoff, which just has stuff that I articles I've written, uh, and then I have Celia Center, which is my nonprofit, which has all my courses on it. Okay. Celia Center. Okay. Celia Center is named after my first mother that I could not live with and grow up with. Okay. Oh, and you named the center. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. So the links to all three of those in the books, and I'll put Primal Woman in there. And then what is foster care animation and what is adoption animation also will be below. That's really wonderful to watch with kids and then start to have the conversation with them about what do you think is your story and yeah. what do you want to do to help make sense of, is it a question box? Is it a sad bag? Is it an anger bag? Cause all these interventions are in the videos as well. 
Okay. So that's something like people could even share with parents as a resource or put on their website or something like that. And it's YouTube. So they can just watch it. Oh, so many great free resources you offer too. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Well, you're amazing. And what you're doing here is fantastic. I learned from so many other therapists as well. So thank you. We're all learning from each other. We're all a big play therapy community. Exactly. (laughs) All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Right behind the curtain.